All right. Well, this morning, I am in week two of a sermon series I've entitled Masterclass uh, Storyteller, uh, looking at the parables of Jesus, the stories that Jesus taught while he was here on earth. And the best definition of the word parable, in case you're unfamiliar with that term, is from uh, John MacArthur, I think. He called a parable this. He said, a parable is an ingeniously simple word picture illuminating a profound spiritual lesson. It's an ingeniously simple word picture illuminating a profound spiritual lesson. And so Jesus would go around and he'd teach things with lessons like the kingdom of God is like a seed or God is like a father welcoming home a wayward son. He would use these word pictures that would stick in people's minds using analogies and metaphors from everyday life. But he also taught in such a way that those who thought they were self-righteous and sophisticated would dismiss Jesus and think his teaching was just basic. But those who had faith like a child, those who came to him with childlike faith would come to know Jesus, come into relationship with him and come to understand what it is that he was teaching. And so these parables had a way of dividing those who just dismissed Jesus and looked down on him from those who had come to him in humility. This morning, we're going to look at what is probably the most famous of all the parables of Jesus. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. But, but, but for those of you who think you know what this is all about, just you might not. You might not know. I'm, I'm going to warn you up front that the way it's taught in Sunday school is a moralistic parable and lesson about loving people and especially those who are, who are enemies you don't like. That's not the main point of the parable of the Good Samaritan. As you read it in its context, you find that there's a lot more to this that you may have missed in your Sunday school classes. So um, we're going to take it one step at a time, reading through Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. I'm going to explain what it means, and then we're going to look at three implications for us today. So if you have a Bible, you can open up to Luke 10, 25. If you don't have a Bible, they'll be up on the screen for you. So beginning in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So the scene begins with an expert in the law. This is not a lawyer. This is a theologian. It's an expert in Jewish law. It's an expert in the Old Testament law of God. And so this is someone who knows the Old Testament. And it says he stands up to test Jesus. He's not asking from a genuine curiosity, it sounds like. He's asking to test Jesus. A lot of these experts in the law and Pharisees and religious leaders, they wanted to test Jesus so that they could catch him in something that was wrong and then dismiss him, okay? So he's not coming from a genuine place. He's coming to test Jesus. Nevertheless, motive aside, this is a pretty important question, right? I mean, even if you take away the motive, this is an important question. What must I do to live forever? What must I do to be right with God? What do I have to do so that when I die, I'll be in heaven? What do I have to do to be saved? It's probably the most important question that he's coming to ask of Jesus. But Jesus knows he's being tested here, and so he doesn't respond by giving him an answer. He responds with a question of his own. He says this, What is written in the law? He replied, How do you read it? And the teacher in the law answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus turns the question back on him, and he says, well, you're an expert in the law. What do you say? How do you read it? What do you have to do to inherit eternal life? And he answers it. He says, love God with everything you have, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he's right. That's the core of the Old Testament law. Jesus himself said the same thing when he was asked in Matthew 22. When an expert in the law tested Jesus with the question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So even Jesus agrees. This sums up the law of God. It sums up the Old Testament. Everything hangs on this. Love God with everything you have. Be devoted to God above all other things and all other people. And love your neighbor as yourself. Meet your, ne your neighbor's needs and cares with the same intensity and fervency and care that you would do for yourself. Love your neighbor the same way that you love yourself. But then Luke writes that the expert in the law wanted to justify himself. And so he asked, who's my neighbor? What does that mean? He wanted to justify himself. To be justified is to be declared innocent. 
not guilty, to be, to be right with God, to be righteous. And so he wants to justify himself. He wants to make sure that he's right with God. So he asked Jesus for clarification on who his neighbor is. Now, in those days, the understanding of the Israelites was that your neighbor was your other fellow Israelites. Those were your neighbors. Those are the people you're supposed to love. You had no obligation to those outside of your nation. Remember, that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43, that you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Because that was a common saying. That was what their expectation was. My neighbor is my fellow Israelite. That's who I'm supposed to love. And so he's hoping, this expert in the law, he's hoping that that's what Jesus is going to say. That Jesus is going to agree with him and say, yes, your neighbor is your fellow Israelite. Good job. You have cleared the hurdle. You are right with God. You're justified. But Jesus does not respond that way. He responds by telling him a parable. He says this, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So Jesus in response to the question, who is my neighbor, tells him this story. He says, there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very familiar road, a road that the Israelites traveled often. It was known as the Way of Blood. The Way of Blood, great name for a road, right? 17 miles downhill from Jerusalem to Jericho, going through all kinds of rocky terrain with caves and rocks that were perfect for robbers, perfect for thieves to hide and wait for travelers to come so that they could steal from them. And that's precisely what happens to this man. This Israelite is walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's set upon by robbers who beat him, steal what he has, and leave him half dead. But then it says, two men walk by, first a, Levi, a priest and then a Levite. Priests were the servants of God in the temple. They were offering sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And the Levites were kind of the subordinate the, the helpers in the temple, the assistants. They could serve as assistants to the priests or as police or as maintenance in the temple. And both men, of course, would have been very familiar with the Old Testament passages about loving your neighbor and loving mercy and doing justice to those who were suffering. In fact, the Levites and the priests had to give out alms to the poor. They had to give out to those who were in need. But Jesus says, in this occasion, the Levite and the priest walk by on the other side, leaving this man half dead. So why do you think they pass by? Why don't you think they stop to help? I can think of three reasons. One would be contamination. If they believed that the man was dead, they would have known that if they came in contact with a dead body, they would have been considered unclean under Jewish law. They would have been contaminated. They would have had to go back to Jerusalem to become clean again before they could continue on to Jericho. And so maybe they just, they just thought, you know, this guy's dead. It's not worth the hassle. Maybe they didn't stop because... They were afraid of their safety. Maybe they were afraid this was a trap. They see a man beaten and bloodied and lying dead, almost dead, <clears throat> in the road, and they're certainly afraid that if they stop to help, those same robbers are probably there and are going to beat them as well. So they hurry on their way, afraid for their own safety. Or third, maybe they walked on by just because they were afraid of getting entangled. They did not want to get involved because they knew it would be complicated if they stopped They'd have to find a way of helping the guy to a nearby town, which is very far distance away. Whatever it was, it was going to take too much effort on their part, and so they just walked by pretending they didn't even see. Best to leave this guy and hope someone else shows up. So whatever the reason was, the priest, the Levite, walked by. Jesus says they just walked by, leaving this man, this Israelite, lying in the road. But that's not the end of the story. Continues in verse 33, but a Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn, and he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So the priest, the priest and the Levite walk by the injured Israelite, but the Samaritan stops and he bandages his wounds, probably tearing up his own garments to use. He uses his own wine as an antiseptic. He uses the oil 
as a balm, to sanitize, to clean the wounds, to seal the wounds. He puts the injured man on his own donkey, which means he has to walk alongside him the rest of the trip. He brings him to an inn. He spends the night with him, taking care of him. And then he leaves two silver coins, which would have been about two months' worth of room and board to make sure this man is taken care of. And he tells the innkeeper, I'll return if there's any needs he has. Now, certainly, Jesus is telling a story to show the lengths that this Samaritan goes to, which would have been, first of all, just incredible to go to that kind of lengths for a stranger, to be willing to inconvenience yourself like that, to put yourself at safety, at harm, in the, in the way of harm. But when you take into account that the Samaritans were hated by the Israelites and the Israelites hated the Samaritans in turn, it makes it all that more amazing that the Samaritans were descendants of the Israelites who intermarried with the non-Jewish people when Israel was in exile. And then they became this kind of mix of paganism and, and Judaism. And they hated each other. The Jews saw the Samaritans as half-breeds, of, as pagans. And the Samaritans hated the Jews in return. And so here goes Jesus giving a story that gives as the hero a Samaritan. I mean, maybe this would have been the same for those who are really patriotic Americans. Maybe if Jesus were telling the story, raising up a member of Al-Qaeda as the hero of the story. And then Jesus ends by asking the expert in the law question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He says, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So Jesus tells him basically this. Love your neighbor like the Samaritan did. Be willing to inconvenience yourself, to risk your own safety, and to bear the cost for anyone who is in need, even your enemy. He says, you want to know what it means to love your neighbor? This is what it means. To love the way the Samaritan loved. Now, as I said in the beginning, the main point of this passage is not really about loving your neighbor, despite what you might have been told in Sunday school. Let me share three implications from this passage. First implication is this. God's law sets an impossible standard. God's law sets an impossible standard. Remember, Jesus asked him, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, oh, you got to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, be devoted to God and love him above all of the things, and then love your neighbor with the same intentionality and fervency as you love yourself. Meet their needs and care for them in the same way that you meet your own needs and care for yourself. Remember that Luke writes that this man wanted to justify himself. He wanted to set the bar at a level that he could clear. Who's my neighbor? Hoping that the answer is going to be, my neighbor is my fellow Israelite. And Jesus instead raises the bar up to here and says, you want to know what it means to love your neighbor? Anyone you see that's in need, inconvenience yourself. Risk your safety and bear the cost to take care of them, even if they're your enemy. This man wanted an answer that was achievable. He didn't want that answer. In Romans 10.3, Paul writes, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. That's what this man is doing. He's not submitting to God's right. He wants to establish his own righteousness, a bar that he can clear, a hurdle that he can leap over. We're not told in this passage how the expert in the law responded, but I'm guessing that he either dismissed Jesus like the rich young ruler and walked away, or he said, I'm going to double, you know, I'm going to redouble my efforts to love in that way, Jesus. But how should he have responded upon hearing that this is what it means to love your neighbor? He should have thrown up his hands and said, Jesus, this is crazy. This is impossible. You really expect me Every time I see someone in need to do this, to be willing to bear the cost, to inconvenience myself, to risk my safety, to do all of this for everyone in need, to do this for this man lying in the grave, and then, and then to find another, and then another, and do you know how many people there are in need? Do you know how many people there are suffering? And you expect me, whenever I see someone suffering, to do this? Jesus, I can't meet this standard. I can't love my neighbor in this way. I think if he had responded that way, he would have gotten Jesus' main point, and he would have been met with grace by Jesus. Listen, the law tells us to love God perfectly, 
with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. It tells us to love our neighbor, even our enemy, with the same intentionality and fervency that we meet our own needs and care for ourselves. That everyone around us, we're to love in that same way. And none of you measure up. No one measures up to that. No one perfectly loves God. No one always puts God above everything else. No one always meets everyone else's needs and cares for them in the same way that they meet their own needs and care for themselves. No one measures up. This is a standard that has been raised so high that no one can measure up. This is why I'm telling you it's so important to read the parable of the Good Samaritan in its context. If you just take it out of its context and treat it like a moralistic lesson about loving people, especially people you don't like, either you're going to A, fail miserably, or B, you're going to have to grade yourself on a curve. You're going to have to lower the standard and try to justify yourself. So that you say, yeah, I, I do this. I love people. You know, I, 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 I can love my enemy. I could do this. Jesus instead holds the law up like a mirror to this man to say, this is the standard, and you don't reach it. This is the standard of what it looks like to love your neighbor, and you fall short. He tells the expert, go and do likewise. Go. You know, go and be willing to inconvenience yourself, risk your own safety, bear the cost for everyone who's in need, even your enemies. Now go. Go and try to live that out. Please hear me. God doesn't grade on a curve. This isn't like try your best and God will say, you tried. Good job. This is what he said instead about loving your neighbor. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Ready? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. That's God's standard. Be perfect. As God is perfect. Love your friends, your enemies, your strangers that you meet impartially the way God does. Now go and do it. Go and do likewise. James says the same thing, James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So even if you, even if you took care of 99% of the bloodied and bruised and left for dead people you saw, 99% of the suffering and missed that 1%, so still you haven't reached that standard of love. So again, if you hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, you think it's just a moralistic lesson about go and love people and love your enemies and love people the way God loves, and you say, yeah, I can do that. I just got to go try harder. Then you've missed his point, that you have this expert in the law coming to test Jesus. He's come and trying to justify himself, to set a bar that he can handle, that he can hurdle, so that he can walk away from Jesus and say, yeah, I'm good. I'm right with God because I love God and I love people. That's what he's trying to do. This expert in the law is trying to justify himself, and Jesus instead raises the bar to such a level that the expert in the law, he's hoping, will say, I don't meet that. God, I can't meet this. I can't meet this standard, Jesus. And if he confessed that, he would have been met with grace by Jesus. This is what Paul writes in Romans 3, 19 to 24. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, you hear this? No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Got that? So yes, the law says love God perfectly and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Paul writes here the same thing Jesus is saying. The bar is so high that no one, no one, can justify themselves by observing the law. No one will be declared righteous by observing the law. That's what the law says, but the law instead is to show you your sin, that you have fallen short. But now, here's the good news. A righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely 
by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What does that say? For all who, like this expert in the law, seek to justify themselves, to stand before God and say, God, look at how I love people. Look at all the, how good I am. It says, you fall short. You can't justify yourself that way. But there's a way to be right with God. There's a way to be righteous. There's a way to enter heaven. There's a way to be saved that doesn't depend upon how good you are, how well you've obeyed the law. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. That leads us to the second point, the second implication, which is this, that Jesus met the standard in his love for God and his love for you. And everyone said, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Jesus met the standard, that impossible standard that none of us could reach to love God perfectly and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We fall short, but Jesus met that standard. Remember, Jesus tells them, this is what it means to love your neighbor. Be willing to inconvenience yourself. Be willing to risk your own safety. Be willing to bear the cost for everyone who's in need, everyone who's suffering, even if they're your neighbor. It's impossible for us to do consistently. But Jesus did that. See, there's one important detail that I haven't mentioned yet in this passage that is so important to get the point of this passage. Remember, what was the original question that he asked. The original question was, who is my neighbor? But Jesus answers a subtly different question, which he poses at the end. Which one was a neighbor to the one in need? Instead of answering the question, who is my neighbor? He answers the question, which one was a neighbor to the man in need? Which one was acting in a neighborly way? Why does this matter? Think about it. If Jesus were answering the question, who is my neighbor? How would the story have gone? He would have said, okay, there was a Samaritan walking down the road. He got beaten and left for dead. The priest, a Levite, walked by, but then an Israelite came and he saw him and he took care of the Samaritan lying in the road. And the moral of the story would have been, who's your neighbor? The Samaritan's your neighbor. The enemy's your neighbor. The man you despise is your neighbor. Go and do likewise. And the expert in the law would have said, great, okay, it's a lesson about who's my neighbor. My neighbor is even my enemy. That's who I need to care for. But what does Jesus do? He switches it around and he puts the Israelite in the road. The man that the expert in law would have identified with, he says, okay, you're walking down the street and you're beaten and bruised and left for dead. That's the one that the expert in the law and his crowd would have identified with, not the Samaritan, but the Israelite. You're left for dead. You're beaten and bruised in the road. And a Samaritan comes your enemy, the one you've hated, the one who hates you. He comes, and he rescues you. What's the difference here? Instead of it being a moralistic lesson about who's my, who's my neighbor, your neighbor is even your enemy. Okay, go and do likewise. He's saying instead, you were the one lying in the road. It's a transformative story now about a man who receives grace and mercy that he did not deserve, that saves him and transforms him. The point is you're not the Samaritan. You're not the Samaritan walking down the road, saving the man lying in the ditch. You're the one lying in the ditch in need of saving. Jesus tells the story in such a way that his audience would identify with the man in the ditch, the man who's been beaten and bruised and left for dead, in need of mercy, in need of help, in need of someone to come and save him. And then he receives that salvation from someone who is his enemy. And so the question of the story becomes, what if you were saved by someone who owed you nothing but rejection? I hope you understand what I'm saying here. It's, again, it's not a moralistic story about just go and love people who are different than you. It's a story about you were in the ditch. You were broken and bruised. You were left for dead. You were in need of salvation from someone who was your enemy, someone who, from whom you deserve nothing but rejection. That's the genius of Jesus. Instead of just telling a moralistic story, he tells a transformative story about grace and about mercy. You were that person lying in the road. You were the person who was bruised and battered and left for dead. That is you and who you were. That's your status spiritually before a holy God. And Jesus did not just inconvenience himself to save you. He left the eternal bliss of heaven 
to come down and rescue you. Jesus wasn't just willing to risk his own safety. He came and he died on the cross in your place to take the punishment you deserve to save you. He wasn't just willing to bear a financial cost the way the Samaritan did. He was willing to bear the cost of your sin and the punishment that you deserved and the wrath of God to save and rescue you, to lift you up out of that ditch, to put you back and to heal you, to put you back on solid ground, to heal you, to restore you, to save you. That is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you understand? It's not just a moralistic lesson about being good to people. It's first and foremost a story about you and the impossible standard you could not meet and the Savior who came and rescued you, even though you deserve nothing but rejection. As it says in Romans 5, 6 through 10, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Very rarely will anyone even stop on the road to rescue someone. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were lying there on the side of the road, bruised and battered, deserving of eternal separation from God, Christ died for us. He inconvenienced himself. He risked his safety. He bore the cost. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, there it is, you see that? When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Yes, the story of an Israelite lying and his enemy, the Samaritan, coming and showing him grace and mercy and saving him. It's not just a moralistic lesson about being good to people. It is pointing to the gospel, that you were that Israelite lying in the ditch, and the one who owed you nothing but rejection came and bore the cost to save you and rescue you. So instead of being a moralistic lesson that says, now go and do likewise, and we just pull ourselves together and redouble our efforts to being good people, instead it becomes a transformative story that transforms our hearts as we see the amazing grace and love of God. And if only the expert in the law had responded by saying, Jesus, I can't meet the standard. You expect me to really love everyone this way? I can't do that. He would have been met by grace. Jesus would have said, now you get it. You get it. The question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a trick question. You can't do enough to inherit eternal life. You can't love God perfectly. You can't love your neighbor perfectly. You are in need of a savior. You're in need of grace. As Paul wrote again, Romans 10, three through four, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness, but Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. In other words, Christ Jesus perfectly lived God's law. He perfectly loved God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind. He perfectly loved his neighbor as himself. And so that's the end of the law. And now the way to become right with God is not by obeying the law perfectly, but by putting our faith in Jesus who died for us, who lived it perfectly and died for us. That's where you find forgiveness and righteousness. So now that I've given you the main point of the story, now we can look at point three, which is this. Now go and love others as Jesus loved you. Yes, we're still supposed to go and love our neighbor the way that the Good Samaritan did. It still stands. It's still a lesson. It's still an implication for us. But it has to come after points one and two. If it doesn't, then it becomes just a moralistic Sunday school lesson where you're taught, okay, now go and love people who are different. And either you're going to fail and fall short or you're going to lower the standard so that you can meet it. But if you begin by seeing the grace of God, by seeing how he has saved you when you were the one dying, dying in the ditch, then and only then does your heart become transformed so that you can then go out and love others the way that he's loved you. You can go out and be willing to inconvenience yourself, to risk your own safety, to bear the cost for others, even your enemies, because you know 
that Christ did that for you. 1 John 3, 16 to 18 says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So the expert in the law asked the question, who is my neighbor? And the answer is clear. Your neighbor is any person in need, whose need you can see, whose need you can meet, even your own enemy. And love is sacrificial action. It's interrupting your schedule, expending your money, risking your safety and reputation, ruining your property, even for a stranger. That's all the things that Samaritan did for that stranger, for his enemy, so that you can do what's best for him. Does anyone else find this message frightening? I do. This implication, again, if it were not for the grace of God, that we are under grace, that we're not going to be judged and rejected on how well we measure up to that law, but we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are saved. And now that we are saved, he says, go and love the way I have loved you. But I find this message frightening. There are so many needs. You look around this world and there are so many needs. Widows, orphans, the poor, the disabled, the mentally ill. You go on and on and on. There are so many needs in my own family. So many needs in my own church. How do I meet them all? I'm afraid to be generous. I'm afraid to give. I know I can't meet them all in my strength. I know I fall short again and again and again. And that's why I first and foremost throw myself on God's grace and mercy. And then my hope and my prayer is that as we understand the gospel more and more, we'll realize and find the strength to love more than we are currently loving, to give more than we currently give, to be generous, to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for those who are in need. Got to start somewhere. That's the call, to love extravagantly, to love your neighbor in the way the Good Samaritan did to show the same grace and mercy as Christ has shown to us. Again, remember what he said in Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Remember how he said, love your, it's not just love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's, it's love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. If you just love those who love you, yeah, that's what everyone does. That's what tax collectors do. That's what the pagans do. If you want to be my people, love the way I have loved in a way that stands out from the crowd. In the early years of Christianity, this is what set the church apart. This is what Julian, the last pagan emperor of Rome in 361 to 363 AD, it's when he was the emperor. He was irritated by the spread of Christianity, which he was trying to stamp out and kill. And he said this, do we not observe how the benevolence of Christians to strangers has done the most to advance their cause? It is disgraceful that the Christians support not only their poor, but ours as well while everyone is able to see that our own lack aid from us. Because that is why Christianity spread so much. It was their sacrificial love for their neighbor, even people who were not of their own tribe and own religion. So the last passage I want to read this morning is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. This is for those of us who are afraid to be generous. That's what Paul says. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let this encourage you. Those of you who think about being a giver and generous and sacrificially giving, you're afraid, well, what, what, where am I going to get all that I have? God promises you here. He says, I will give you what you need. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. And I will make sure you have what you need. Just 
follow in my footsteps as I have shown you grace and mercy. Go and show grace and mercy to others. Be generous and love extravagantly as you have been loved. Amen.